I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago, taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I'm reading from Mark 10, 25 through 28. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer, do this, and you will live. Good morning, friends. We greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from St. John's United Methodist Church in Tucson, Arizona. We have had our first real taste of the monsoon season this past week, so that now we not only have high temperatures, but we have high humidity along with it. We come to you with anticipation that our presence in your home will bring joy and blessing as God speaks to your heart. As one watches the news in America these past days and weeks, it becomes obvious that there is a sizable element of our society that do not believe that they have to abide by the laws of our land. This same spirit of anarchy prevailed in the counterculture revolution of the 1960s and the 1970s. But it should not come as a surprise to see secular people acting outside the law because oftentimes even our church leaders have been doing the same thing for decades. When they could not get the changes they want through legitimate established procedures, they simply took the law into their own hands or ignored the rules that exist. This being the case, it comes as no surprise to learn that some of our seminary professors and even some of our pastors have taken the position that the law of God, especially the Ten Commandments, are a part of the Old Covenant. We're living under the covenant of grace, they say. The law is no longer necessary for our salvation. Our scripture lesson, which you have just heard, relates how that a lawyer stood up before Jesus one day and posed a critical question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? We do not know the motive that this man had, but we certainly cannot fault him because the question he raised is of vital interest to every one of us. What is of interest to me 
is that for his answer, Jesus took this young lawyer directly to the law of God. He asked him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And the lawyer responded with these words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's interesting to hear Jesus' response. He said to that young lawyer, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, if we read this right, Jesus is saying to this young man, keep the laws that you have just mentioned and you will have the eternal life that you seek. Now, to a conservative evangelical Christian, this is a profound statement that demands my attention. But when it comes, I think about it, it comes to me that this is a long established pattern of God and of Jesus. For we read in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, that when Jehovah God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he brought them to the very mountain where he had first encountered Moses. And there he formed those 10, 12 tribes into one nation. And the first thing that God did to establish that new nation was to give them the Ten Commandments. He was telling Israel that the kingdom of God is a kingdom where there are norms that have to be learned and they have to be followed. Now, we follow into the New Testament that when Jesus sat down with his disciples to give them the Sermon on the Mount, he opened the heart of that message with these words taken from Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, heaven and earth shall pass away. One jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Then he proceeded to in demonstrate how his interpretation of the Old Testament laws were to be understood in his new kingdom. The reader will note that not only does Jesus refer to the laws of the Old Testament, he does not relax them one iota. Just the opposite, in fact. In each case, Jesus takes us deeper into a spiritual level of understanding of these laws that the Jewish people had overlooked. Now, in this passage that is before us this morning, Jesus is making a direct attachment for obtaining eternal life to the fulfilling of two commandments that God had given to Israel. Once again, we see that Jesus does not lay aside the law. He embraces it. He brings it front and center in our quest for eternal life. How is it then that professors and even pastors can be telling their people that we can ignore the laws of the Old Testament? We don't even need the Old Testament anymore. What I discern is that the God, that God the Father and God the Son do not separate the moral law from our salvation. They are part and parcel of its same spiritual reality. Now, I also believe that there's a reason why you can't separate these two. One thing we learn as we study the Ten Commandments is that through these commands, God is revealing his nature to humanity. He's telling humanity how we must live if we are to remain in relationship with him. And he is saying to us, you cannot dishonor your parents who gave you life and expect the presence of God to be manifested in your life. You cannot lie to your friends or lie to them. You cannot devalue human life by taking the life of another person. 
You cannot violate our commitment of marriage by participating in extramarital relationships outside of marriage. You cannot steal that which belongs to another person. You cannot live in, with a constant discontentment over what others have and you do not possess and still expect God's blessing to rest upon you. The reason that carnal humanity finds fault with God's law is because they have no love for God, whose character the law describes. You can never love God's law while you exist in a state of rebellion and dislike for God as a person. Instinctively, we seem to know that you cannot separate God from his law. The love that merits will demand all the power of the human mind, all the power of the human body, and all the power of the human soul to love God in the manner that God expects is a consuming love. It is a exclusive love. Once we have this love in place in our hearts and minds, keeping God's law becomes no problem. It is not difficult because we are in love with the author of that law. May God give us grace to understand this beautiful truth this morning. Let us pray. Oh God, if we were to ask one thing of you this morning, it would be that you would give us each one the capacity to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our souls, and with all of our strength. To give to you an exclusive, all-consuming love that you so rightly deserve. We know, Father, that once that love prevails within our hearts, your law will not become an obsession, but it will become a delight like the psalmist found when he wrote the 119th Psalm. Lord God, this is our prayer today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.